Hi, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining today's webinar, SciML, Scientific Computing plus Machine Learning equals Industrial Modeling for Engineers. I'm Misha St. Amant, Head of Marketing for Julia Hub, and I'm joined today by our presenter, Dr. Chris Rakakis. He's the VP of Modeling and Simulation at Julia Hub. He is also a research affiliate at the Julia Lab at MIT and the lead developer of the SciML open source software organization. Uh, <clears throat> Chris, I'm going to pass things off to you to get things started. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So today, what I want to talk about is just a very high level discussion on Julia for, you know, why Julia is being used in the high tech uh, uh, industries, specifically how scientific machine learning is being integrated into some of these processes. Um, so, you know, this is going to be fairly high level. You know, we're going to be talking about some of the, the things that are going on in the language and some of the things going on with the mathematics and how these are combining to give a new software. Um, we won't go too much into the details of the, you know, actual algorithm derivations. I'll point you to some other uh, videos that kind of go into some more of these details if, for, if you're interested. But we want I kind of want to you know paint the large picture about what we're doing generally with Julia Hub these days. Um, and, and the core idea behind all of this is scientific machine learning, right? And this is the idea that um this is the idea that you know in order to make good predictions, it's really all about having sufficient knowledge, right? And this knowledge can either come from models, right? So prior information, things like, you know, Newton's law of gravity, well, or things like, uh, you know, Einstein's general relativity, right? These are these are things that we know to be true, but then also other things that are useful as knowledge is data, right? This is things that we know to be true in a sense that we've measured that, it, that it's true, right? These are different senses of knowledge, but if we can combine them together and we have sufficient amount to be combined, then we can make good predictions. And the, the core hypothesis behind our scientific machine learning stuff is that, you know, these are somewhat interchangeable, right? That as long as you, you know, if you have enough data or if you have enough models or if, you know, or if you don't have enough data, maybe you can compensate with some models, right? As long as you can get to this endpoint that has, you know, enough of it together, you can make good predictions. And so what I'm going to be showing is in a lot of these applications where we've been able to achieve this by using the combination. Now, a lot of the techniques that we that we make use of are built upon these universal differential equations, right? So the universal differential equation flow is what, what's shown here. Um, this is some work that we did back in open uh, in in tw uh, 19, or 2019 and in 2020 um, about essentially ways to be able to autocomplete the development of mechanistic models using machine learning. And what you do for, for this method is you write down a differential equation with all the pieces that you know. Say you you write down the differential equation with all all the, the known physics of the system, and then you model your unknown re, uh, reactions or interactions using a universal function approximator. Uh, normally, these are neural networks, so there are cases where they're not neural networks using details, details, right? Um, but then the, the what you do is you, you fit these universal function approximators to essentially capture what you did not know about your model, right? And then when, once you've captured them, they are a computational representation of the things that you did not know how to model, in which case you can pull it out of that context and start to analyze it individually. Um, and so what, what's being shown here in this case is that, you know, one of the analyses that you can do is a symbolic regression. So you can say, well, what did this learn? You know, and you can pull this out of, out of, the, out of its context and ask, you know, okay, what is this, what is the simplest symbolic uh, representation? So that way that this gives you a guiding point for, you know, where, what the mechanistic model could be. And I think that the, the easiest way to kind of explain, you know, how we how we really get to this is to kind of look at how these pieces come, come together bit by bit, right? So machine learning, standard machine learning that everyone knows today is, you know, neural networks predict future, right? So one nice example of where scientific machine learning and how its pieces come together was uh, something that we did early on in, in the pandemic, right? So um, we, we had this study. That was uh, that was looking at you know with 21 days worth of data, how well can we predict you know future um, uh, future uh, where where the future peak would be right? Um, you know this is was part of the the Safe Blues project, which was about you know building the, these applications to be able to use extra data to make these predictions. And at the time, we thought, well, you know if we you know from the most basic data and the most basic machine learning, what's a result that we get? And I just remember when this first plot came out, you know we looked at it and we go. 
Yeah, that's neural networks for you, right? Because what we showed was that, you know, with 21 days worth of data where you, you train the neural network from, you know, zero to 21 days worth of data and you just ask it, what will COVID like be like in the future? It just goes, well, I don't know, because machine learning doesn't have the information to know that, hey, you know, early on in a pandemic, you expect exponential growth. You, you expect that there will be a peak in, in the near future. You expect, like, There's a lot of things about this system that we know, but this, but the standard machine learning technique, so here this was just U prime equals a neural network, a neural ODE. It has none of this information. And so with 20 words, one, one word, days worth of data, this is the kind of a result that you would expect from extrapolating with very small amounts of data, right? And you know, we're not the only ones to show that neural ODs have this behavior. There's a whole literature of machine learning that shows this kind of behavior, right? But now the interesting thing was at the time we were working on scientific machine learning. So we said, well, what happens if we do add a little bit of this scientific knowledge that we have? So this is a case where, you know, you probably saw SIR models all throughout COVID. Um, but here, this is an SEIRD model, which it has, you know, susceptible individuals become exposed, become in infected, um, and then they either recover or they perish, right? Um, now, there's a lot of the, the the interesting thing with these kinds of models is that you can use data that uh, that is outside information, right? So this highlights one aspect of mechanistic modeling, where you know, in theory, what we're doing is we're trying to you know use a mechanistic model and we're trying to fit it using a time series. But when you're building an, uh, a mechanistic model, you have information like, well, D is supposed to represent the number of people who die, and so what is the percentage of people who die uh, versus the number of people who uh, you know what is the percentage of people who die versus the percentage of people recover, right? This is kind of information that you don't necessarily need to gather from your time series on infected and exposed. You can check the hospital data, right? You can see, you know, this is the percentage of people here. So therefore that constrains a lot of our parameter values. So when you go to these mechanistic models, you can start to use a lot of outside information, outside data, uh, because your model has certain interpretations. So that's the first piece that, that becomes, you know, which makes the scientific machine learning uh, very useful. It, may, it actually allows, it makes it easier to use heterogeneous data sources, right? Now, the second thing that we see here is that, well, you know, when you build this kind of model, uh, the difficult thing is how many people are exposed to to the disease, right? Uh, with COVID-19, this is very difficult because depending on whether people wore masks, whether they did not wear masks, whether they were vehemently opposed to masks, right? There are different areas of the world had very different exposure characteristics. And trying to capture that in just one mathematical function is not very easy to do. And so what we showed was what we did here is we said, okay, you know, this is a good case where we can say there is something in our model that we don't know. So let's use a neural network here. And you can see that just using this amount of prior information, it get it lets it gets you at least from 21 days worth, worth of data, it gets you to about 40 days of, of nice predictions, right? Um, and that's not very much, even though it doesn't look like we've used much information here, there's a lot that's embedded in here, right? So because this same neural network is the same piece going positive positive and negative, right? This already embeds that, you know, the number of individuals in our in, in our model is always constant, right? Um, because this is all the terms here are negative, if the neural network is, is positive, so you take the absolute value of its output, because all the terms here are negative, the number of susceptible people is always decreasing, which you'd expect in it early on in the pandemic, right? So all of these things are true about our model. So we've encoded a lot of prior knowledge that we know should be true, and this is really just kind of saying, you know, fill in a small piece of this. And you can almost then think about this as a very, as constrained machine learning, where it's undergo it's being trained under the constraints that we know must be true about ep epidemic models, right? Now, the last piece that comes together then is this discovery. Once we've learned this piece that, that is in the middle of our model here, we can start to ask questions like, you know, what what is the clear uh, the simplest function that it might represent? Um, and then when you do this sparse regression, there's two things that tend to come out of this as well. And so one thing is it gives you some nice generalizability. This is something that's still being worked on in the field, but it does show that, you know, it's not perfect. You know, it didn't find, you know, what the exact equation was there. I mean, there isn't one for this case, right? But, you know, it doesn't, doesn't find an exact equation, but, you know, it does find something that, that is a reasonable uh, predictor to, to, to the future. And we have seen that, that this, sparse, this sparsity does uh, improve generalizability in a lot of contexts. We don't have a general proof for it, but we have seen this to be the case. And so there's a lot of the people who are working on, on this aspect of it. But I think that the other piece that is more important is that this guides science, right? Because the reason is because now we had a 
mechanistic model. So we know what D means. We know what R means. We know what I means, right? So when we train this neural network, we let it be a function of S, uh, E, I, or D. And what it told us was that um, you know, this, this trained neural network piece is a function of uh, I and S, right? It actually found that the, the best fitting function here was a subset of the variables, which is a prediction, right? The prediction is that people who have already died from COVID uh, are most likely uh, not causing people to become exposed to the, to the disease. Right. And so if you're doing this in a, in a real modeling context, right, because your variables are in this mechanistic model, because they're in this form, they have meaning. And if you add a new term to your model, like, you know, I times uh, S squared, right, this is telling you some kind of mechanism that you are missing. It's telling you a mechanistic prediction that, that you should have, you know, had missed in the first place. And this is something that you can try to understand and you can try to justify, or you can try to see if you can't justify it and see if the, you can get the model to work without it. Right. But the interesting things and thing about this is that, you know, not the, from we get to use now with machine learning, we get to use heterogeneous data um, and we can use that to help the scientific process come up with better models. And I think that, you know, a lot of people will just look at the predictions and a lot of people have taken uh, the scientific machine learning approach and said, OK, this is useful for coming up with good predictions. So therefore, let's just run with it. But I think that the real interesting thing that comes out for people who are industrial modelers is this helps you close that loop for how do I come up with a good model? How do I know what, what literature to read? How do I know what the next experiment to do, right? The tools here th that are that are given make that loop a lot quicker because it changes it from something that is, you know, guess and check what we don't know what equation that could be. It can be any equation in the world to something where it gives you a guiding point. It says, this is a, this is a approximation to what this missing equation could be. Try to understand why this is a good approximation. Try to see if there's other literature that suggests that this would be a good model for expose, uh, exposure to, to the disease and, and run with it from there, right? And it gives you a starting point for the scientific process. And so we've, we found that, you know, there's many different way, cases where, where this comes true. Um, you know, we had a whole load of, of papers during the pandemic uh, um, that was that was strictly focused on showing, you know, the fact that these scientific machine learning methods, if you make use of them, like the QSIR and all these other ones, right, if you use these methods, then you can very clearly make good predictions from less data. All right. First, you know, you can just see, wow, line goes better, right? But I think that the more interesting thing is that, you know, as I mentioned, these models are constrained to give you something that's true. And so like, well, a peer machine learning method or a peer time series method can uh, project in the future that more than 100% of people will be infected, right? These models that we are using and, and training in scientific machine learning case have these constraints built in such that they cannot make those errors, right? They they have these conservation laws and everything. And so that that's one of the big reasons why we attribute to their success, right? So I think that there's, there's the, there is the aspect of just improving the predictions with less data, but there's also this aspect of understanding and knowing that you're that your predictions are actually physically realizable in all cases. And I think that that's something that's very useful for, you know, a lot of safety contexts. Um, now, this, this, this idea of these universal differential equations have really kind of taken hold and a lot of different researchers have, have taken them in different directions. I think that there's this, this case right here uh, that I like to point out. Uh, we actually created a notebook that was used for, for teaching um, in, in the astroinformatics course. So if you go to this link right here, you can actually find the, this Jupyter notebook and get things running on your own machine. Um, but what, what they did was they said, well, you know, we have this new data from LIGO on uh, gravitational waves. And what it, what LIGO had measured was these binary this binary black hole system, and so let's try to model it, right? So if you try to model this binary black hole system, you have these spinning black holes. You could assume uh, Newtonian physics in a rotating frame. That's what these equations are here. Um, but then you have all these these extra terms because you know Newtonian physics is not going to be correct for black holes. You need to have relativistic corrections, right? And so what they were asking was, could a universal differential equation approach, you know, pre-started with Newtonian physics, learn what the relativistic correction should be to the system, right? And um, the black data, the black points are the data points. You know, they extrapolate to the future. Uh, the the true waveform, so the true data is is in blue. The the learned waveform is in orange. Now, this does not give the same predictions as real, uh, general relativity. Now, general relativity is like ten digits of accuracy correct. 
this is like only four or five you know, digits of accuracy. But what you can see is that from what is considered a relatively small amount of data, this is they're able to learn something that's predicting quite well into the future for something that's using machine learning, right? Um, and, and so this kind of helps you, you know, in, in this case of if you know, this really shows that if you know a lot about the physical laws, if you know a starting point, then you can use that in some real, very realistic scenarios. And I do give a different talk, which goes into a lot of these different scenarios. If you search on YouTube, um, accurate and efficient scientific machine learning, uh, you'll find one of my talks it's an hour and a half, which goes into, I think, 30 or 40 of these case studies. Um, I do think that I'm not going to do all the case studies here. Um, I'm going to focus on just a few of the newer ones that are more industrial focused or, or, or physical focused. Um, but if you want to kind of see the a bigger smattering of them, you can check out the, the YouTube video. Um, one of the cases that I'll highlight here is uh, is a case where some researchers use this universal differential equation technique to take a physical model that was not extrapolating well and improve its extrapolation, right? But the interesting thing here, right, as, as I mentioned, right, the, the, the real purpose of this technique is once the model is be better able to give predictions, it has actually done something where it improves the model that you have, right? It, it fixes your model. And so the real question that they had was, well, you know, we build a, they built a toy system of a building. You, they have a picture of actually this little toy building on um, little stilts that they can move around uh, to be able to simulate an earthquake. And from the data that they had gathered, they're able to use the machine learning method to learn what was what they did not know about the physics that was important to earthquakes. And then from that, be able to say, you know, now we have an improved model of how buildings shake during earthquakes. So therefore, we can improve the way that we build buildings for earthquake safety. Right. And so I think that that's the, the key, right? For a lot of things that we do with machine learning, we just focus on, you know, prediction, prediction, prediction. But with scientific machine learning and specifically these techniques that are about learning models, right? If you have enough of a mechanistic model and it's about finding out what you, you know, finding out what you had wrong about the mechanistic model, you can use what you learn. You can use the improved predictor to tell you more about what's wrong with the model and scientifically investigate that to really solve the questions that you want, right? Because normally in science, the, 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 uh, normally in industrial applications here is not about just making a better prediction. It's about, well, we want to make a better prediction because a model that predicts better is more likely to predict, you know, to, to is more useful for understanding earthquake safety. And so once we get a better predicting model, now we can build a better building. And that's really the key behind these techniques. Um, I think, you know, the, the, this is a very recent one that we just put out there, which is about, um, you know, chemical process modeling. Uh, with Julie Hub, we will be putting out something on uh, a process modeling library in the near future. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and this is one of these early test results that are looking at, you know, the, the applicability of universal differential equations to these uh, pro chemical process modeling cases. Um, this was a case where it was a reaction to fusion advection models, um, you know, for, for sorption and, um, and what we and what what this showed essentially was that with a very small amount of training data and using some prior knowledge about the the uh, the chemical flows right the reaction or uh, the advection diffusion parts of the system we can focus on just learning a very low dimensional part the the reaction system um, and from just learning the reaction system on a small amount of data be able to predict well well into the future um, and so this this takes something that is a very large high, high, large state space system and saying okay we don't need to learn you know thousands and thousands of variables, we need to learn, you know, one function or two functions, which are strewn out through through the system because of the PDE aspect of, of the of the model, right? Um, and so this this turns a, a very high dimensional problem into a low dimensional uh, uh, learning problem. And so then the data that we had was more than sufficient to be able to extrapolate to some fairly non trivial behavior into the future, right? Um, you know, the, the fact that that it's able to to define where it's going to level out in, in these different futures given uh, different different inputs is it's something that would look surprising. To standard machine learning because you know we did not have enough data to even see that it would level out in future cases but there is a lot of model that's embedded into this case and that's why it's able to work out um Another case that we did uh, at Julia Hub in, in conjunction with some uh, some collaborators at CMU was showing that these universal differential equations can be used to be able to build uh, better battery models, right? So, you know, as uh, degradation models in batteries are some are a piece that are you know, I wouldn't say that they're ad hoc, but battery degradation is difficult to predict because it's a model of how physics is changing, right? How the, how, how the physics is breaking down. Um, and 
what was what's shown here is that one way to be able to model the, the changing physics is to use this kind of universal differential equation approach with these kind of battery models. So SPM or P2D types of, of uh, battery models and um, use that to be able to learn the, these, these degradation terms that can then be used to be able to then predict how degradation is changing a battery. And again, the, the purpose of this is not to give a model that predicts better, but if you can learn how batteries degrade, uh, if you can better know how batteries are degrading, then you can generate better catalysts. So that way you have batteries that don't degrade as fast. And that was the, the purpose of this automap project that we were doing with the CMU. Now, I think that one of the, one of the uh, nicest uh, demonstrations of um, of scientific machine learning and how it's made this transition to industry, right? A lot of these cases that I talked about are more in this earlier or the earlier case. I want to highlight um, one of the cases that we're doing with, uh, you know, Julie Hub is a, has his partner company, Pumas AI, um, which, which has been doing a lot with the pharmacometrics and has really been doing well in this discipline. Um, and Pumas AI and uh, specifically Deep Pumas is a product which has been really taking scientific machine learning directly to pharmacologists. And I want to kind of explain uh, its use case a little bit because it's kind of like the furthest along scientific machine learning case that I've seen in real industrial applications. Um, and so so, so first of all, what is Pumas and what is nonlinear mixed effects modeling? It's a type of differential equation modeling. So it's you know what you know and love if you come from physics. It's actually more similar than you than you'd expect. But the the real purpose behind it is it's about trying to find models that are in, uh, that are specific to different individuals, and then trying to understand how are differential equation models different and the same between individuals, right? And the purpose is to be able to come up with a model so that way you can know, you know, should I be giving men versus women a different amount of this drug? You know, will, will it be toxic level for one and will it be a non-efficacy level for another, right? You know, how does weight, uh, sex, height, ethnicity, all these different factors affect how we should be doing our drug dosing, right? So and this is used in the clinical trial phase to be able to uh, make these predictions and be able to ensure that, you know, people are safely going through these trials. And so the, the, the core of a nonlinear mixed effects model is something that looks like this. You have what's called your covariate model. Uh, this has information like your, your covariate information is things easily uh, measurable from, from the clinic, things like weight and sex. Um, this information is then collated in, into what's known as the structural model. And so you, you take your, your information about a patient, you know, and then you, you use that information inside of a function, be able to predict, you know, how their, uh, how the, the, the drug, um, the drug clearance of the, in their body and the, and the, uh, the volume of the gut, these different factors, uh, change by these different and in things that you can measure. And once you have these different, uh, these different pieces, these parameters and tell you a differential equation for how the dynamics of the drug changes. So essentially, if you think about the flow of information, you know, the sex of an individual changes the clearance of the drug, which changes the drug dynamics. And once you know the drug dynamics, you can look at the predicted drug dynamics and say, well, you know, if I give this person a dose of 250 milligrams, um, am, I, are, am I overdosing this individual or underdosing them? And should the dose then be dependent on sex or is everyone getting the same dose here? Right. Um, so this is like the core problem of, 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 of Pumas and nonlinear mixed effects modeling. I mean, if you're not in pharmacology at all, uh, don't worry. I mean, it's just differential equation modeling and inverse problems. It's the same fun stuff that we do in all other disciplines, right? But the interesting thing here is that there's a very special fitting procedure that has to be used. So I don't want to go into too many details here, but the, the key is that you want to find out what it, what's known as these fixed effects, theta, which tell you the average effect of the covariates, whereas the eta are the, are the individual or the individual patient effects. The reason is because if you could differentiate between these two, then you can know, you know, on average, you know, weight changes the the clearance of someone uh, of, of the drug in someone's body by this much, and sex changes the clearance of the drug in the body by this much. If you know that that factor, then you can, you know, when someone new comes in the clinic without any data on this in, individual, you can know some high level information and how that will, how that might affect their intake from the, of the drug, right? And so one of the interesting things that, that that came up, you know, like Pumas has been rather successful in its industry so far, and so one of its big adopters, you know, as shown at at, at the last JuliaCon was Moderna, right? Where um, you know they they noted that Pumas emerged as their go to tool, and you know they had been using Pumas and uh, for doing a lot of the, the modeling in turn, uh, and one uh, some of the models that they've been that they use this for was the COVID nineteen vaccine and specifically the uh, the pediatric vaccine, right? Now. 
as people who work on software and 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 uh, differential equation models a lot, you know, we, look, we looked at this problem. We said, you know, one way to be able to improve their workflows is to make the fitting process for finding the fixed effects and the random effects uh, as quick as possible. But by working with the scientists, you know, what we really find is that you know the scientists will spend months and months of, of time trying to discover what this model should be, trying to verify each of the components and everything. And so anything that improves the process to getting this model model faster is something that is more valuable than anything else, right? You know, any kind of, like, you really want to talk about the speed up, right? The real speed up is speed up of human labor, which is how do you, how do I get to a reasonable model faster, right? And for this, we realize, well, if we have all the scientific machine learning stuff, what we can do is we can uh, do scientific machine learning in this nonlinear mix effects context, where once again, as I mentioned, you know, you, these neural networks can capture missing terms within a model, and then you know they can uh, they can capture in missing terms within the structural model or within the dynamics model, and uh, either way you know they 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 can you know use the same fitting process. So the same fitting process that we have for finding the fixed effects and the random effects, we can use that in the case where we now have neural networks embedded under this assumption that neural network weights are fixed effects or random. You know there, there's other details that I'm glossing over here, but the key is that you can use this process to be able to help someone predict what the model could be or should be given what they did not know, right? And, you know, now in this case, the 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 actual fitting process is rather difficult, but once, you know, if you can put neural networks into that process through differentiable programming, then what you get are neural networks here. And then you can, you know, same process as before, you can pull that neural network out. You can do a symbolic regression on, in, on it to find out what did it, what functional forms is it finding and stick the, the simplified model in there. And then when you look at the pill bottle at the end of the day, you know, these predictions that, that you have on your, on your pill bottle of how much people should be done by and how that should change, you know, that actually comes from these nonlinear mixed effects models. And now this is a way to be able to, you know, change, be able to use a neural network as an intermediate to be able to find out how that model should be predictive, but not require that, you know, your pill bottle has a neural network with its weights on it, right? So at the end of the day, you can use neural networks for, for their power, but not necessarily have to have them as part of that final solution. And you can end up with something that's a bit more interpretable because it has this kind of interpretable context around it. Um, and this is something that, of course, is being productionized. There's some ongoing clinical trials using it. There's, uh, there's, you know, actual code as part of Pumas. If you're in this domain, you can go check out the the workshops that are running at ACOP and and you know the, these different conferences, which are teaching people to do deep Pumas. Um, so this is this is a full this is a full you know in process like scientific machine learning is not necessarily the future; it's the now kind of thing. And um, this is something where we you know the the Pumas team has been going you know to the conferences after conferences and showing that you know this technique is working winning awards and and so this is you know scientific machine learning in this domain is really is really you know there right um now what we're doing at julia hub is we're, we're taking these these kind of same principles and now making scientific machine learning applicable to many other domains as well um now one one of the uh interesting uh uh case studies that, that we are that we've re recently shown was that um we, we we showed that you know using these kind of techniques for physically informed learning can greatly improve over uh techniques that don't make use of it um uh one of the, the case that i'm showing here was for, with uh, some speed over ground sensor data um where here we we have the um is a car that was you know the, using the speed over ground sensor data uh that's predicting the the orientation of of the car um you can see this is with just a standard gp so just standard machine learning with with a python system um that was done by by another team um and here what we're showing is these are the predictions on orientation that are given using a scientific machine Machine learning type of approach. Um, not going to describe all of this approach. Uh, we will be talking about it in the near future. It's a new architecture that we come up with called the Digital Echo. More details will come from Julie Hub in future webinars. But really, the the core the core of what's going on here is that it's it's embedding some certain aspects of the known dynamics of the system. So that way, we when we know, say for example, we're predicting on momentum, then we know that the solution will end up smoothing that instead of you know directly predicting prediction. Um, certain aspects like that, and along with uh, certain pieces baked into the architecture, make it so that way we can get some greatly improved predictions from the same data and from the same amount of data. Um, so this is just another kind of demonstration then of some of the industrial industrial pieces of uh, industrial uses of, of scientific machine learning, which are starting to come out from, from Julia Hub. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit behind, so I'm gonna to, to jump forward a bit here, and and I want to go to this uh, this 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 portion now on you know why why is Julia uh, leading scientific machine learning? So you know there there are a lot of people who come to Julia because of scientific machine learning and because of these techniques, right? What I've described is you know just things about how you know. Scientific machine learning is interesting. You might want to make use of it, but why specifically is, are a lot of these tools being built in Julia? Right. I think that that's something that that should should be addressed. Um, so one of the core reasons for this, at a very very high level, right, is this productivity versus performance. Um, I forget where where where, where this uh, graph was pulled. Um, it's it was a it was a study that was done by some external group. Um, and what they what they did was they wrote you know a bunch of different codes for uh, oh this was for a bunch of different benchmarking codes and they looked at the the code size uh, versus the execution time right uh, for some uh, some form of Pareto optimality and um, what was found is that really for you know in terms of this Pareto optimal front uh, Julia and Chapel tend to to do really well right where in terms you know the the Julia code and the Chapel code the, these are two these are two languages for example that can let you write very precise code that end up giving you performance at about the same SC now you know you could use C Rust and these other pieces but of course the code that it takes to be able to do some of these applications is just a lot more so it, you know it's this 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 mixture of simplicity and performance that has driven a lot of the Julia development um, but I I think that you know that's that's a very very high level I want to dig into some more specifics that are more specifically related to uh, scientific machine learning um, and I think that one of the one of the foundational pieces here that we like to point out is the differential equation solvers right so this is the work that I did for the first five years before we started the Julia Sim group. Um, and, and there's many different aspects that, I'll, that I could point out as to why the Julia, the Julia differential equation solvers uh, achieve such performance, right? So one of the things to note is that in a cross-language benchmark, they not only out, seem to outperform the, uh, the Python and MATLAB and R tools are pretty much across the board, but they also in many cases are outperforming a lot of the uh, older C and Fortran methods, right? Um, there are some you know, details, 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 you can read a lot online that, that we get in there, but a lot of it comes down to the fact that, you know, because it's it's simple to do this development, right, it's, it takes not as much code to do this development, a lot of these advancements are algorithmic, right, they're, they're newer algorithms that were, uh, the algorithm, a lot of the algorithms that we use in these solvers were not even invented at the time when a lot of the Fortran methods were, were implemented. Uh, there's algorithmic aspects, and then there's also computational aspects, for example, um, the way that, that SIMD is being utilized uh, so being, you know, having uh, chip dependent or architecture dependent SIMD, um, you know, these are things that you expect from, say, a BLOS implementation, right? So BLOS implementations tend to be something where you say, you know, no human will be able to match their performance because they do a lot of, you know, uh, architecture dependent, you know, uh, SIMD optimizations. But with the, some of the tools that we have in Julia, like uh, loop vectorization and such, where we do similar uh, techniques to those as part of our differential equations solvers. So there's there's a lot of uh, optimizations in the computational aspects, but also optimizations in the in the algorithm aspects. And that's why then at the at the end, right? So I mean if the the pure I mean if you just write down a, a you know the, the simplest code you know C in Fortran versus Julia, you'll get the same performance. And there in fact there though you'd be using the same compiler a lot of these times. But the advantage of Julia here is that it's very simple to then really start to optimize it more. Do more complicated algorithms that are using more tricks, more optimizations and then be able to get to to a better spot in the end um now and i think that one of the things that really highlights this this kind of development is that you know when when we start to talk about a lot of things like gpus right a lot of people go okay you know i have you know i have this thing that i do i also have my gpu code um in a lot of cases you know they're they're actually completely different uh, codes right so if you look at something like pytorch they have an implementation for cpus they have an implementation for gpus we have in, in Julia, we built a lot of these different pieces to be able to make sure that you can compile a code that is for Julia code, not just a CPU, but also retarget it to GPUs and multiple aspects there. So one aspect is that it can um, is that it can target many different GPUs. So for this code that we have, it's a, a DiffEQ GPU. The paper just came out um, about uh, three three weeks ago, I think, at this point. So if you want to check out the manuscript, please do. I can I can send you the details. Um, but the key here is two things, right? One thing is that the code can retarget to different GPUs. It can target to CUDA, One API, AMD, and uh, uh, even the Apple M1 chips, right? So you know, even if you just have one of the newer Apple chips, it has a GPU baked into the CPU, and it can use that GPU as well. 
Um, and so, you know, one code base is targeting CPU and all four uh, GPUs. And so, you know, we can, we can claim at one in one case that, hey, this is the first major ODE solver suite that, that supports, you know, one API Intel GPUs, right? So that's one win that we can get out of this. The other win that we get out of this, though, is that we can actually hit very good performance out of this. So, you know, here what this is showing is the performance of JAX versus MPGOS, which is a C, uh, which is a C++ CUDA written code, which is, you know, kind of speed of light of, you know, someone sat down and really optimized an ODE solver for being in a, in a CUDA kernel. And then this is the, the in, and then in the green is what we get from this uh, Diffy QGPU comp compilation strategy, right? So we have one code base. This code base compiles, you know, to CPU and four different GPUs. But when you compare it against MPGOS, you know, something that's really hand optimized only for CUDA, we see that we just about achieved this speed of light performance, which is about a hundred times faster than JAX. Right, we just uh, and it also is about a, a hundred to a thousand times faster than PyTorch. This graph le leaves that one off, but just you know to be aware, you can go check out the paper. Right, so it achieves the speed of light that we know is possible because someone hand optimized that the, the CUDA kernel. We we can match that in the case of CUDA, but we have this code generation process that is in giving us these other GPUs. Right, and so what this really means is that you know instead of having you know spending time on okay, I often I build a GPU so I build an ODE solver and CPU. Now I have a team write an ODE solver on GPU. Now I have a team write an ODE uh, solver on you know Intel GPUs. Right? Instead of doing this redevelopment over and over and over, we have a single code base that is getting all of these tricks. We have a single code develop a single code that's getting all these tricks and all these optimizations, but also is being retargeted to all these different cases. And so what you kind of see is that you know we really have a improvements. You know, a lot of them um, tend to be algorithmic because the tools that we have allow us to keep on working on the same code base instead of abandoning it uh, every single time a new architecture comes up. Um, and one nice thing to, to kind of highlight here on this note is that, uh, so we just put up a demonstration of a static compilation of some of these ODE solvers into a web app, right? So it statically compiles the ODE solvers uh, into WebAssembly so that we can run natively on your browser. So no, no Julia backend, it's, it's compiled into to JavaScript. Um, and so you can actually go to this web app. It's just tshort.github.io slash Lorenz uh, uh, dash WebAssembly dash model.jl, right? If, if you check my tweets, I recently tweeted this out. You can go to the app. It's fully functional where you change parameters around. It also, right below the, the working part of the app, it has a full description of how it was done. Right. Um, so, you know, one of the one of the things that we're doing with Julia is we're, you know, the Julia's deployment strategy is not perfect right now, but there's a lot of work that we're doing at Julia Hub on static compilation. Uh, so static compilation to embedded devices, but also static compilation to things like WebAssembly to be able to improve the way that we can deploy these algorithms for industrial con context. Right. And so this is kind of like an early demonstration of how of some of these tools working. Um, and, you know, not everything works as well as we want right now we want it to be a bit more automatic but if you go to this uh if you go to this uh, web app there are the instructions for how it's done fully reproducible and you can do this for a lot of julia codes today now i think i think that one of the interesting things here right is to really kind of understand that you know so a lot of people ask the question of okay you know you can jit compile julia but you know can't you jit compile some other languages as well right um, there's this, there's this uh, recent paper in, in Nature Methods that I think uh, really highlights what some of the overheads are if you make use of, say, Numba plus SciPy. And so I like to kind of go through this calculation of, you know, what happens if you just try to use a JIT in some parts of your code instead of, you know, having a full, fully JIT language, right? And so, you know, this, this is a, this this article, Julia for Biologists, please check out the whole article if you want some extra details. But the idea here is that, you know, let's say we have when we have an ODE that we wanted to solve. So this is the Lorenz equation, right? This ODE is a function call, right? So you call f of x, y, um, and it does eight scalar operations inside of it. And what we want to do is we want to, you know, put this in an ODE solver and make it go fast, right? Now, you know, if you take this code, if you if you take the code that represents this ODE solve, right, and you stick it into Julia, you have one you have one function call, uh, and one fused function call for f, right. Um, in Python, you have you keep on going back to the the Python interpreter, right? So the the difference here is that Julia, you know, it will JIT compile your code. It will make a code that that is fully you know uh, fully static, and so you will only call the function once. It'll do the the it'll basically do everything, execute all the instructions, and then give you back the result, right? 
In Python, each of these function calls will keep on going back to the interpreter, right? So if you call f, it will the interpreter will then go and look at what's in the code of f. It will call you know alpha times x, and then it'll call you know so it'll keep on going back to the interpreter. So there's actually eight function calls that you have that go on in, in this eight scalar operations. Now you can get you confuse all of them by you know doing this jcompile trick with a uh, number, um, and so that brings it down to, to one function call. Now the interesting thing here is how what is the function call cost from the the in, uh, run times of these different languages, right? Um, in Julia, you have about five nanoseconds. And in Python, because it's an interpreted language, right, it has this 150 nanoseconds. Um, now let's put that all together, right? So, you know, if you if you then put all this together and you say, okay, what is the theoretically inferred in real-time calculation of one F call inside of the log Voltaire equations, right? Um, what you see is that, well, in the SciPy implementation, it requires that you that you write this in such a way that you allocate an array. So right there, you have 300 nanoseconds for allocating the output of this differential equation. You have your eight scalar operations, which each take about two nanoseconds each. So that's 16 nanoseconds. Um, and then you have the fun time of the function calls, right? The, the, which you can, you know, you can go onto your computer and measure that Python's is around under 50, you can measure Julius around five nanoseconds. Why Julius function calls are so are so low, I can give, you know, if someone wants to know, I can give a lot of details on why. But um, the the result here is that, you know, if you if you just calculate out how long you'd expect these things to be, you get an inferred time, which is actually really close to the real time if you if you write down and measure this. So, you know, I implore you to actually try this yourself. Write down, you know, write down these functions in Python, do it with number and, and see how long it how long it takes per execution. And you can see, you know, and you can attribute. So what are the two factors that are major uh, attributed to this? Well, the Julia Simel organization and all of its tools are written in a way so that way there are no array allocations which are required for these F calls, right? So it uses a very specific form of mutation to avoid this uh, this array allocation in the ODE solvers, but also because it, uh, the ODE solvers uh, are JIT compiled and the languages are JIT compiled, right? The, these two pieces come together. And so you're just calling Julia to Julia functions in, in, compiled, in a compiled form. And so you only hit five nanoseconds per call instead of having to hit these extra function call times, right? So even though something like Numba is able to, you know, take a function and then make it go faster, right? If you have to repeatedly call this function and this function is not large enough, the still the overhead of doing that one function call ends up hurting the, the language. So when we do the, these these experiments, the, you know, this is actually being done with a with a JIT compiled version of um, functions going into SciPy. And that doesn't help SciPy because it doesn't overcome the major overheads that actually exist in there. And I think that, you know, if you actually do this measurement and do this experiment, you kind of see like, oh, you know, JIT compiling functions and sticking them to the SciPy just won't be the answer for this reason, right? So, um, and I think that this this really you know highlights then what's kind of going on with with the, a lot of the development, right? So, the, you know, the Julia differential equation tools are developing really fast, and you know, a lot of people want to attribute it to a lot of people attribute this to me. I don't think that that's the case. I think the real case is that there's a lot of people contributing to the stack because you know, if you want to contribute to the ODE solvers, SDE solvers, DDE solvers, DAE solvers, this is all the same stack. So we have people from you know the Klima Climate Modeling Group uh, to you know people building out the Trixie PDE solver. Like there's a huge group of people who are all contributing to the same code base. Um, and one of the reasons why a lot of people contribute back is because the Julia packages are completely written in Julia. So if you know how to use Julia, you can also contribute to the packages. And so the number of contributors that you have to the differential equation stack is pretty wild. And so even one of the things that's really happened here is that, you know, machine learning has gotten really popular, especially differential equations in machine learning have gotten popular. Um, and so, you know, if you, you know, and so there's these things like neural ODEs and neural SDEs, and as they've come up, different kinds of individuals who never really were in the differential equation space came to differentialequations.jl and started contributing as well. Right. If you look at what's happened inside of the the you know say something something like the SciPy stack, right? Well, SciPy is really only used in like normal Python, right? You know, the SciPy stack is not necessarily used with with uh, with uh, machine learning. And so, what you see if you, if you go through the development history, there's really about five people who keep the SciPy.ode in part of the library alive. Um, 
a lot of them kind of just work on maintenance these days. You know, go go check the history if you if you want to if you want to check. Right, the the number of developers is a lot smaller, and the, and it shouldn't be a surprise because a lot of the code in that part of the library actually stems from the Fortran code. Right, so a lot of people who who are actually doing development in the in the area of the ODE and a, very few people are actually ever touching the actual ODE solver code because it's still the Fortran. In fact, I think I just checked today that the LS ODA code was not uh, did not have a change in the last eight years or seven years. Um, um, so, you know, there's certain pieces in there. I mean, it has the stability, but, you know, how come the algorithms are improving? Well, the algorithms that exist in there are in Fortran, right? You, you do have other people who are, you know, trying to develop some other things around, say, PyTorch, right? But, you know, each of them, for each new uh, machine learning uh, library within Python, they're developing a new ODE solver. And this ends up usually being a PhD student with, you know, uh, a P it's usually ends up being a PhD student who's kind of solo developing this for a specific uh, machine learning language. Language, right. So instead of having, you know, an organization with you know many, many different developers, you have this kind of org uh, this kind of system where SciPy has this sort of Fortran code, which a lot of people don't necessarily touch. And then for each machine learning library, you know, you have uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Jax, each of those have a different ODE solver, which has, you know, generally just one or two contributors at, at this point. Again, it hasn't had the time to, to, to grow to be able to have that community. And they're all focused on one, one aspect, right? Because they come from uh, PhD student projects. And so, you know, it, one of the re big reasons why I, I would attribute you know, the Julia tools to growing so fast is really just the centralization of developer resources. And, you know, so everything is is a julia code which makes it so that way the percentage of users who become developers is quite high for the julia organizations um and then also a lot there's a lot of reuse of packages uh, in different areas and so for those reasons we see, see a lot of people developing on the code and so of course things are moving fast right there's just a lot of people doing this um and I, you know, this is the kind of thing i think that requires a meme right where we say you know what's the julia package for machine learning and the julia package for standard situations you know what what's the ode solver that you use for neural odes it's differential equations.jl what's the ode solver that you use for you know uh, climate models it's differential equations.jl what's the ode solver that you use for systems biology it's differential equations.jl right they're the same picture and i think that this is, you know, I think that this is really, um, you know, this is a bigger contributing factor than what I think most people recognize, right? The fact that, you know, since we have been able to centralize the 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 organization and centralize the development, we just get a lot more people working on the same piece of code and that irons out things over time. Um, and but and, and I think that so, you know some of the features of Julia have really helped this actually become true. I really like this example that was posted, and so very early on in differential equations in twenty seventeen or in twenty seventeen, yeah, um, Mose Giordano uh, posted on the forum and said, "Hey, I took my package measurements.jl and I took your package differential equations.jl. I put our pieces together and it created a cool thing that no one knew would work, right? <laughs> and go what? Like how do you how do you, how do you create a new feature to my library without?" even contributing to it and I, and I really love this example because well, you know what, what he did was he created this number type right so this number type is a measurements type so it's a you know it, it's basically defines this plus minus operator so you have these numbers that have an uncertainty in with linear uncertainty quantification and if you take these numbers and you stick them into the ODE solver it actually solves it with in with with in the with respect to his number type um, and generates solutions that have these 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 uncertainties associated with them in fact if you just take it and you plot it and we'll also put the error bars on the plot for you. And so this is a completely functional code of, you know, of uh, of diff OD ordinary differential equation solvers with the form of specialized form of uncertainty quantification and generating plots for that uncertainty quantification. And you can see, you know, this is line over line with the, the numerical and the analytical solution really lining right up, right? This is, this is the full functional code to, to do this, right? And I think the thing that's really interesting here is that if you look at a lot of other organizations, you know, people who are doing things in like, you know, uncertainty quantification, right? Uh, you would normally see that, oh, hey, pe people working on uncertainty quantification, because they cannot necessarily use their new number type with SciPy, they also develop a specialized ODE solver. So, you know, again, you have like your, your sixth ODE solver library mentioned here, which now is just one ODE solver, you know, maybe the Dupree method, Dupree 5, embedded within an uncertainty quantification library specifically specific for working on, you know, these types of uh, specialized uncertainty types. And so, you know, but with differential equations, 
you know, what we've been able to do with multiple dispatch is make it so that way they're all the same ODE solver. So that the uncertainty quantifications uh, kind of domain is using the same solvers as everyone else. They can make use of the set five method or the or the stiff uh, the methods for stiff ODEs, et cetera. So this was the first case that we saw this. Uh, people followed up with this and developed libraries for things like polynomial chaos expansions and other types of, of, of uh, number-based uh, uncertainty quantification, right? Don't want to go into too much detail there, details, 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 but essentially the, this kind of whole domain was able to use you know, the same ODE solvers over and over and over without having to do that redevelopment process. And which means, which is really what brought us and a lot of Julie Hub to this area of, well, you know, we want to do things with, you know, controller and we want to do, you know, uh, controls with robust validated arithmetic and a lot of these extra pieces. You know, we've been working with these folks that do validate arithmetic because they've used our libraries as part of it. And so this code, you know, we kind of have co-developed this over time, be able to learn some of these procedures, make sure that we have a common code base. And once again, you know, that just grows your contributor number. If the people working in uncertainty and quantification, the people working in, con in controls, the people working in all these different disciplines are also all giving back to the same stack, that's where we get our, our de developer advantage from. And I think that I want to highlight one, one last thing about the, the language here. You know, we talk about the one language problem, right? Um, and, and I think it's, you know, it's very difficult to sometimes understand how the one language problem can change how you optimize code. So I want to mention one case that showed up in, in, in the Pumas Pharmacometrics case, right? So in the early development of Pumas, what it, what it realized was when we were doing this kind of nonlinear mixed effects process, we did a bunch of benchmarks and we saw that, um, interestingly, it turns out that you know, one of the things one of the things that you find out in in this process is that there's a you know a floating point of power here and there's a floating point power inside of the um, inside of the uh, ODE solver. And it turns out that those uh, operations, if you do the benchmarking, are the most expensive operations of the entire process. So you know you create this entire stack that you then say you know is all about pharmacometrics, right? But what you find is that if you want to optimize this piece, well, the thing that takes up the most time is a floating point power operation that's deep to, baked deep within the ODE solver. And the thing that was interesting about that was that there was no reason for that pro for that process to even be exact because the heuristics of it's part of the heuristics of time stepping. So it's already a heuristic calculation. And so the reason why it's exact is because floating point power in programming languages are computed to 16 digits of accuracy. Um, but there's no reason for a heuristic, right? Which is already kind of like, you know, it's just for choosing your next Delta T with according to some uh, rules, right? There's no reason that that needs to be 16 digits of accuracy. And so when we're doing the optimization of a Pumas, what we, one of the things that we did was we, uh, we improved the ODE solvers to have a, a, a different implementation of floating point power that was uh, correct to four units of the last place. So uh, 12 digits of accuracy. That was enough to be able to, you know, greatly decrease the cost of that operation and then make it so that way it really doesn't show up in any, um, in any benchmarks anymore. But if you test out something like Dupree, you'll you'll you you'll find if you do a, a cross language benchmark, or if you have if you have a way to be able to, to profile all the different pieces, this is one of the factors that's actually improved our our ODE software um, uh, uh, timings. And um, this is the kind of thing where you know by having the the you know the pharmacometrics layer, the ODE solvers, and and the language itself all in terms of one stack, we looked at the whole thing and saw. Hey, look, this piece of the ODE solver wants a different implementation of floating point power, right? Nothing to do with, you know, uh, pharmacometrics or like, you know, it's really looking at the whole stack together and seeing like what, how do these pieces all come together? What actually matters for performance? And we found some bits that really gave us that, you know, 2x here, 3x here, 2x there. And that's how it was able to be optimized. Um, I think that, you know, I just love the, the story in the end, just because this is like a nice case of, you know, if you just have your ODE solvers as a Fortran code and you just say, we just call this and we keep on calling it with different parameters. And that's how we do our pharmacometrics fitting. You would never have seen this kind of, uh, this kind of interaction. To, and you, so you'd never do this, uh, this optimization on it. And this was one of the crucial optimizations that was required for Pumas to then get this performance advantage over things like Fortran and eventually take over this field of uh, pharmacometrics. So I think that the one language problem is very underestimated in, in these kinds of aspects and, um, you know, real studies about how, you know, real life, cases about how this has been able to improve codes, I think are really the kind of the key here.
I want to end with a segment on uh, Julia and how we are building tools for high tech enterprise, right? So I mentioned that, you know, at Julia Hub, right, you know, well, we've done a lot of work on science and machine learning. And then there was a lot of work on, uh, you know, how the Julia programming language um, improves some of the scientific machine learning tools. But now with Julia Hub, these are all coming together to give us new tools specifically for high tech enterprise. Um, and so this is what brings us into Julia Sim, right? We're really looking at this and going, you know, the, what, the next project that we need to be doing is developing a modeling and simulation platform that, you know, not only can you design things in a GUI where you drag and drop your, your components, right? But, you know, all these things that I talk about with scientific machine learning, this needs to be embedded into the GUI and, you know, being able to calibrate your models against data in a simple way with the automatic differentiation, right? That needs to be embedded into this GUI workflow. Uh, being able to build neural network surrogates, like all of this needs to be brought to the level to the point where the scientists are actually working so that way it's not something that's just you know advanced for advanced coders um and so we have this GUI in development I'll say you know this is like a sneak peek screenshot but you know stay tuned for JuliaCon which will we'll definitely talk about this a bit more um you know, and really the, the, the key is that we're, we're developing this all in the cloud. So that way, you know, as this system requires, you know, more parallelism, right? We can essentially ask for as many cores as we want because, you know, Amazon, you know, Big Daddy Amazon and its cloud system just has, you know, essentially infinitely many cores and GPUs out there. And so we're developing this software where, you know, you can build out these very large scale uh, models in a point and click GUI, but still get that performance of an HPC. Um, and so I think uh, um, a nice case study here, I think I am getting to, to the end. Um, so I'll say that, you know, th this nice case study actually has another video on, on YouTube. You can check out uh, Brad, who, uh, Brad uh, who, who talks about um, his, what his work at ITW and Instron. He, had, he talked about this at the last JuliaCon and about how um, his team has been able to use the Julia-based tools to be able to improve the model of their, of their car catapult system. Um, and so they are using these modeling toolkit tools and, and Julia Sim with in this kind of production environment. Um, Julia Sim is still quite early, so it's not quite available to everyone yet, but you know, with these kind of industrial testers, we are trying to make sure that its system and its, um, and its tools are being developed towards you know, the, these, these end needs with all the different things that are required, such as you know, the, the final deployment aspects. Um, yeah, I think that uh, I'm just about at time here. So, you know, the last few things are just more and more case studies. So I can, I can take a few uh, questions, I think, at this point. Of course, we have several that, that came in. Do you want me to read them to you? Or have you yeah. got them? Okay. Um, let's see. So uh, can this constrained machine learning approach be formulated using MPEC with uh, inequality moments? Mm -hmm. Shh, don't take my, my students for next project. Um, yeah, uh, you definitely can um, do things where, yeah, you, you can do uh, uh, inequality constraints and you can differentiate them used by differentiating KKT uh, equations and such. So th th there, there are a lot of extra things. Um, and in fact, uh, if, if you if you watch a lot of what's going on in the MIT Julia Lab part, especially some of the work of Avik Paul, um, it's really pushing in this direction. So basically the answer is uh, more, more, you'll see a lot more of this, especially with inequality constraints coming out fairly soon. <laughs> uh, I'll say, wait till, I think they even has a date at this point, wait till October. Um, okay, so the next one is uh, battery, battery degradation is an interesting dynamic problem. Has anything been done to, to use uh, UDEs to study dynamic uh, discrete choice problems, uh, Bellman? Yeah, so um, I, I left the, the dynamic uh, discrete choice problems off of this uh, talk. I recently put a talk on my YouTube, which is about, um, which is about uh, scientific machine learning for agent-based models. Um, you might want to check that out. So the 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 key here, right? So since I didn't go over all of the different uh, you know mathematical details, I skipped over probably what's the core mathematical detail that you know if you try to do this fitting process on data on you know if you try to fit your neural network and then put into the simulator, it doesn't work out so well. But if you if you try to, you know, if, if you actually do the simulation with the fitting process together, right? So if your loss function has a simulator in there, it, it works about uh, two to three orders of magnitude better. Um, one thing that you cite on that is, is this uh, recent the piece that we put out with the, the climate modeling group, right? Uh, so you want to do your fitting process on the you you want to do your fitting process with the simulator inside of the loss function, and so therefore you have to be able to differentiate your simulator. 
This can get pretty hard if you're doing a lot of discrete event uh, simulation, right? Or any discrete simulation because derivatives are hard to come by. Um, and, and so, you know, you can go to the Bellman equation form, but, you know, the high dimensional PDEs can be tricky in their own aspects, right? But one of the things that's really interesting is you can actually extend automatic differentiation to discrete spaces. Um, so this is what we call stochastic automatic differentiation, where it can give you derivatives with respect to expected values. So I didn't talk about that in, in the YouTube video with respect to how you can take an agent-based model and have an automatic differentiation system that generates a new agent-based model whose expected value is the derivative expected of the expected value of your original model, right? And so there's a form of automatic differentiation for these kind of discrete stochastic spaces. This is the kind of thing that we're seeing could be useful for some of these um, uh, other cases. So there, there, I guess there's, there's two things to mention here, right? So there's the discrete stochastic automatic differentiation could be useful in these cases with discrete stochastic behavior. Um, there's other cases that we've done with the uh, with, uh, uh, specifically if you're interested in the macroeconomic modeling um, of showing that you can differentiate some of these DSGE methods uh, using um, well, using some of these Julia tools. Uh, if if you if if you ask me questions, I can well I can well I can probably find that that the paper with was with uh, Jesse Perla and David Childers on uh, Childers on uh, this HMC aspect with the macroeconomics. So if you want to check out that one, that one you know is essentially doing doing uh, HMC for 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 that fitting process. Um, so those two 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 aspects are. The, how we are getting there. Um, I don't think that we have a specific example exactly on the Bellman equation, you know, saying the word Bellman equation, but uh, this is different ways that you could do it. And, the, and there's a third one, which uh, talks about, uh, which is that in the universal differential equation paper, uh, it talks about the, the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. So like the, the extension for, uh, for the continuous case, um, there are ways to be able to use uh, UDEs in specific ways, nifty ways for um, hamilton jacobi bellman equations. Mm -hmm. And that is actually seen in the um, uh, high dim uh, PDE.jl uh, package. So this is another package in the SIMO ecosystem about high dimensional partial differential equations. And you could read into a bit more about how it works. So it's it basically, it does things like forward backwards SDE solvers, uh, do, solving that inverse problem via having a neural network in, as part of it. And you can then represent that as a uh, universal stochastic differential equation. Details, 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 but that's a, a third form uh, there. Uh, and this is then looking at the Hamilton to Jacobi Bellman equations in some extended form. Um, yeah, so check out Hyden PDE. This example is also mentioned in, in the UDE paper. And I could go into more details there, but I'll, I'll, I, that, that could be a whole talk in itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then uh, does Julia have any tool for quantum computing? Uh, yeah, so so there, uh, so there, I think that uh, one of the nicest tools here is there's there's many different tools because, um, so uh, Cuera is a company for that builds quantum acceleration devices. They're right here in, in Boston and we chat with them all the time, right? They, they build a lot of, um, they build a lot of uh, uh, Julia-based tools. Um, Roger Luo is someone who's affiliated with, with uh, uh, some of the uh, Cuera and such, and he builds this Yao.jl, uh, which is a very, it's a very fast simulator for, um, for quantum circuits. And one of the reasons why you get a lot of performance uh, parts is because yeah they reuse a lot of tools from the SIML space for the for the matrix exponential products and such. So there's a lot of co-development that we've done with them and a lot of collaborations that we've had. Um, so if you want to do quantum algorithm design and simulation, uh, this is where you go. If I remember correctly, they do have the ability to take your quantum circuits and uh, compile them down to QASM. Um, so, so if you do want to actually run this on quantum hardware, uh, you can do that. Uh, uh, the Cuera has this blockade.jl, um, and blockade is a package for developing uh, these quantum circuits that you can then run on their hardware, and their hardware is in you know uh, hosted by Amazon. Um, in fact, the Amazon bracket there's this uh, bracket.jl, which is developed by some, uh, I guess oh it's just Rocket, yeah. Um, you know, it's developed by the AWS labs, right, uh, for using uh, Julia uh, for developing broadcast for programs for their, you know, for the Amazon hosted uh, quantum uh, accelerators, right? So if you do want to do quantum computing in Julia, there's a whole bunch of different uh, pieces for that. In fact, um, I have played with it myself a little bit because, uh, you know, 
SIMO, we do a bit of everything. So one of the things that we have implemented is actually um, a, a, a quantum a quantum DFEQ solver. So it develop, it takes your ODE, you know, so if you take your ODE, the same one that's used for the, you know, CPU and GPUs and such, we can actually take that same ODE and develop a generated quantum, uh, quantum circuit that is a quantum circuit using HHL in order to uh, be able to solve that di differential equation, right? And a form of linearization to the plus HHL to be able to, to solve it. So, yeah, I mean, if, even if you, if you want to solve an ODE solver on these quantum accelerators, you can do it. I'll tell you today that it's not very good and not, and you know, it's, it's slow. It's not a great method, but you know, this kind of shows how this co-development in Julia is working though. Right. So, you know, we do, we are, you know, collaborating with the folks in, in the quantum development area. So that way, you know, our tools are, you know, it's quantum future proof, right? So if these quantum accelerators do become, uh, do become fast, we do have ways to be able to compile the codes from Julia differential equations down to QA sum. Um, and, you know, right now through HHL though, there's some work that we've done with uh, Q and co, just about um, uh, developing better quantum. Like, that could be a whole talk in its own. So I'll, I'll cut it there. Um, Chris, why don't we so, take these last two questions and then wrap up? Okay. Yeah. So uh, any any thoughts on deploying train models to embedded hardware? Yeah. So so lots of thoughts there. So so one of the things is that you know um, so there, uh, Julia does have some of these static compilation tools. So you have static compiler .jl, right? Um, it's getting better and better. There, there's some things that we know that we need to be done to be able to improve it. And so it's not as good as it should be, but um, this is something that, that can generate small binaries um, as long as your code does not allocate and does not dynamic dispatch, right? And the binaries are small enough that... Um, and the binaries are, are small enough that it is good for these smaller embedded devices. And so this is something that we're working on. So some of the new features that we're really discussing within Julia Hub are things for doing, being able to do cross compilation uh, to make it easier to, to target these embedded devices, right? Um, now, one of the other one of the other things that's really been happening in the embedded space, and why Julia is well placed for this, is that as we've gotten some more and more complex uh, embedded chips, right? A lot of these chips actually have LLVM front ends these days, and Julia, as you know, is LLVM uh, is able to compile through LLVM. And so we have been doing a bit of test seeing, you know, hey, is it possible to natively compile to some of these, you know, FPGAs and other embedded devices using their LLVM front ends? Um, you do need to make sure that you stick to a subset of LLVM for some of these embedded chips, et cetera, et cetera. But, the, you know, these are some of the things that we are looking into for some of these Julius Sim pieces because we have such an aspect of, you know, one of the big aspects that we're looking at is controls, right? And, and so we are, you know, starting to do a lot of work on targeting code generation towards these controllers. Um, so, so yeah, I think, you know, two things, the static compiler, yes. Well, three things, I guess, static compiler, yes. Julia Sim with uh, some of its, its symbolic tooling, um, spitting out C code, that is something that is going on. You'll hear more about that at JuliaCon. Uh, third thing is you have some of larger chips that actually have LLVM compilers. And um, in those cases, we are in a case by case basis um, for specific groups looking at, you know, can we support those LLVM uh, front ends? So there's a lot that's going on in the embedded space. <laughs> I think that this is one space that's not talked about as much because, you know, we're, we don't have as many wins right now within the company. Uh, but this is a thing that, you know, we will be showing over the next uh, year, a lot of, a lot of work, you know, basically a lot of work is going on internally. And as things are improving, you know, things like, as, as I mentioned, there's this uh, demonstration of the differential equation solver, static compiling and into web assembly. As these pieces are improving, we'll be, you know, piecemealing, kind of showing uh, where, where we are at. And, you know, the embedded story is one of the big things we're, we're focusing on. Um, yeah. Are there any job internship opportunities in this field in Julia? Ooh, yeah. I mean, so the one of the big things is every summer we run Google Summer of Code. Um, and then also we're running the SciML Fellowship along with that. Um, the applications for that have already ended. We've already picked the individuals, though. So that's normally what we do for, for, for a lot of people interested in the summer. Um, I do know that there, there are a lot a lot of these different groups are hiring different aspects. So um, if you're interested in, in AI and simulation, um, you might want to get in touch with the Pumas group, right? Because as I mentioned, this, this uh, Deep Pumas is one of the big products being developed by the Pumas group. And Deep Pumas is still in development, and there was some open internship uh, positions last time I was checking. So um, this is one, one group you might want to talk to. I know the planting space was also looking for SIML people. Um, so that's a uh, planting space is another company to take a look at. Um, I know that Neuroblox, uh, so so uh, we just had something I tweeted out today that the story of Neuroblox and how it's uh, doing psychopharmacology, right? That's also looking for individuals who have a SIML background with Julia. Um, 
Yeah, th- those are three off the top of my head. And like, people sending me emails constantly about like, hey, find some new people. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, uh, that, but there's there's many of these out there. As I, I think that each time I go to a new place, you know, there's always someone looking to hire at these Julia meetups. So um, yeah, so if you, if you get in touch with me, with me, I can see if I can uh, help you find a, th- a thing that might be a good match. Um, yeah, so so next is uh, there's much work done on SciML and Julia. Is there a book or web page devoted to its engineering applications? Uh, yes, there is. So if you go to book.siml.ai, um, this is the the book for the SciML organization, right? So these are actually the lecture notes. Uh, so when when I was an instructor at MIT, I created this this course on parallel computing and scientific machine learning. Um, so the course course notes for a graduate course. Uh, it, it it assumes a lot of prior knowledge. Um, yeah, that's what that's what it does. Uh, but you know, if if you have that that prior knowledge, then um, it kind of goes into you know, for example, how a lot of these OD you know how do OD solvers work? What are all the details of? of um, and then you know, there's a lot of pieces about there about how you know how do you get performance out of stiff ODE solvers? How do you connect uh, stiff ODE solvers to um, matrix color or graph coloring problems to then be able to do sparse automatic differentiation? Um, all sorts of different things like that are discussed in, in a lot more detail. Um, we kind of use this as like a, a form of extended documentation, I guess you could say. And this is actually kind of the training material where when students joining the Julia lab to work on the SciML tools, we hand them this course first as a, you know, the intro. In fact, I would definitely say if you haven't seen it yet, the co- part that's about optimizing serial code, uh, this was supposed to be one lecture, but it turned into, you know, two two-hour lectures. Um, which goes into all these detail about, you know, untyped containers. And I think that the biggest thing is that it describes in detail why Julia is able to optimize these pieces, kind of like in this one slide where I discuss, you know, why Julia is able to get this performance in ODE solvers, right? I think that that's really the important part. So if you want to know all these details about, you know, why is Julia faster if you have a function, like what is a function barrier doing? Why is it faster? You know, uh, what are ways to, you know, let's look at some LLVM code and some uh, assembly code and understand what it's generating and why it's generating like that, whether it's able to optimize, right? The, these notes definitely go into way too much detail um, for the people who are very interested in that. And this course does have a, a, um, a whole YouTube series with it. So this is the parallel computing and scientific machine learning, right? Because this was done during the pandemic. It was all kind of recorded and put on YouTube. So do check out this the course, that, uh, the, the videos that go along with the course notes. Um, yeah, and I think that if any, if you're if you're really interested, you know, and if you want to just start learning more and asking questions, right? We have a big development community. A lot of people are open. If you go to julialang.org, um, if you go to to community, um, you go to here, you can see that there's an official Julia Slack in the Zulip. Um, if you go onto these things, you'll find that this is where our discussions happen, right? So if you want to talk with, you know, hey, how does this thing work in the ODE solvers? And I want to see how it's working. I want to change it. You know, just jump onto the Slack. You'll find me there 24 hours a day. And you'll find all the other out developers around as well. And that's how you can get to know us and talk with us and, and, and learn more. Um, I do see one last question uh, did slip in here. So I will uh, I will try to see if I will do, do, do at least one more here. Um, so yeah, so so what about HPC high performance computing? Yeah, so so Julia has a lot of focus on high performance computing tools. Um, the, the, so a lot of the the course notes actually talk about these tools, right? So this course is about parallel computing and scientific machine learning. It's all about how do you you know mix you know MPI with GPUs with the scientific machine learning things I talked about. Um, so if you want to you know take a look at that, I think that if you go into da, 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 there's a, there's a whole section that was on uh, MPI. Right, so how do you use MPI.jl jail with Julia to be able to do very uh, high performance uh, computing? Um, you can look at that. I think that one of the nicest examples of Julia for high performance computing is Trixie.jl. If you haven't taken a look at Trixie, I say definitely do. Um, they recently have had demonstrations to tens of thousands of cores um, with that very good parallel scaling. Um, so I'd say check out some of the materials. Right, again, this this is a this is a group that we worked heavily with because they use the the differential equation ODE solvers mixed with their PD uh, group. Um, and then they show that this, this mixture of packages is able to actually scale to these large scale HPC systems. In fact, there, um, if you're going to be at JuliaCon, uh, so JuliaCon 2020, what year is it? 2023. Um, in JulieCon 2023, there will actually be a workshop on high-performance computing. Um, so there'll be a workshop on multi-GPU computing. Uh, there'll be a workshop on scientific machine learning. And there will be a lot of different talks on the HPC topics. So um, yeah, so, so check out JulieCon if you really want to learn more about some of these pieces. Um, yeah, I think that we might... Uh, 
might might stop it there. Go, I, go I think it's I think Sorry it's time to that. wrap up. And I want to thank everybody for attending. I want to thank everybody for the questions. It was fabulous. And Chris, thank you so much for for presenting such an informational piece. We will be following up with a recording of the webinar as well as um, a bunch of the materials that Chris mentioned during during the webinar. We'll we'll provide links to those as well, probably in the next day or two. So, thank you, Chris, and thanks yeah, everyone thank for you, joining everyone. us.